So that was released this week where they, they basically took the sequence for the woolly mammoth, for a gene from the woolly mammoth. They synthetically made that gene. They inserted that into uh, lamb cells and they grew up those cells and they made a one kilogram meatball called the mammoth ball. Um, it's gone into a museum in Sweden. It's never going to be eaten. Uh, you couldn't because we, you know, the, the regulatory people would, uh, would never allow it because, you know, uh, lots of reasons there. But it's a fantastic piece of PR. Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Dr. Paul Wood for a very uh, exciting discussion, at least one I'm, I've been looking forward to for a long time on the issue of precision fermentation and uh, cultured meats. Um, as you guys know, as a couple listeners, we occasionally touch on agricultural topics. Um, we had China Prakash on an episode, How to Feed a Warming World, really diving into biotechnology and genetic engineering. Uh, Kenneth Kasman with a look at precision agriculture, but this is a, a different area. Uh, indeed, um, and one that there's a lot of excitement about um, in the eco-modernist community. Um, Replanet um, has a campaign going called Reboot Food. Um, they've been flying, I shouldn't say flying actually, <laughs> they've probably been putting them on a train, but they've been moving uh, George Mambio around Europe in the lowest carbon fashion possible um, to, to talk about this. Um, and so I was cruising around LinkedIn and came across uh, Professor Wood. Um, and he seems to have a lot of expertise in the area. Briefly, Professor Wood, adjunct professor in biotechnology at Monash University, uh, fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology, Sciences and Engineering, and in 2018 awarded an Order of Australia Medal for Distinguished Service to Science and Global Human and Animal Health. Um, so, Dr. Wood, Paul, if I may, uh, welcome to Decouple. Paul's very good for us Australians. We don't go on formality. Okay, Paul, I mean... Uh, I've given you, a, and I know there's there's a lot more there in terms of your resume, and and you know we like to keep it pretty short in terms of the introduction. But um, you know what I enjoy um, about the people that I bring on the podcast is um, typically there are folks who have worked in industry who you know have gotten their hands dirty in some way, shape, or form, um, who understand supply chains, understand um, a lot of the implications that uh, lie behind um, some of the more glossy marketing-based um, approaches to, to things like, say, renewable energy or um, rec uh, recombinant uh, protein, uh, precision fermentation, I think, as it's labeled now. So uh, with that in mind, uh, if you could sort of give us maybe your top three um, kind of qualifications um, to talk about this area. I understand, I think you've worked in, in pharmacy, which are in pharmaceuticals, which, which has uh, some tie-in. So, so go ahead. Yeah, I think the things that are most relevant for uh, today's conversation is that, yeah, I've had a, a career of sort of four decades through academia, through CSIRO, which is a national science body here in Australia, but also probably most relevant is into industry. So companies like CSL, um, then uh, <coughs> I was running the R&D for the animal health division there, and then they sold that to Pfizer. And I eventually ended up in the US as head of uh, global discovery for Pfizer Animal Health and in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And that's the largest animal health company in the world. So we used fermentation was pretty standard. You know, we're vaccine manufacturer, drug manufacturer. So it was my familiarity with the whole principles of fermentation that got me interested in this topic. Um, and what I find often when I'm debating some of this is I'm actually debating with people who've never actually touched a fermenter. So I find it really interesting when the technology really, you know, fundamental technology is the ability to ferment, you know, whether it's yeast or bacteria or, or mammalian cells, um, uh, people, you know, have sort of skipped over that piece and they're, they're really relying on somebody else. And then when you, when you track it back and you say, well, who, whose tech, you know, or whose statements are you relying on? It can be very hard to actually find you know that. So that's what brought me in because I started to see statements from, you know, the, the probably the big one was this Rethink X report in 2020 that said that the, um, the red meat industry, the dairy industries would largely be bankrupt by 2030 because of um, the, that precision fermentation and cell-based meat would transform those industries. 
And I looked at that and I thought, that's just not right. You know, that's, you know, um, so that probably what br brought me into the getting into sort of talking about it because I just saw these statements as being completely false and, and not because I've got a problem with the idea of alternative proteins. It's just that, you know, from a technology point of view, these are really expensive technologies. Um, so to, to use a really expensive technology and compete in a commodity market to me is a business 101 failure. You know, if you've got an expensive technology, you really want a premium product. You want a premium price to justify the cost of the tech. So that's sort of what brought me in. And then um, I almost have sort of become the cranky old white guy who's sort of saying, whoa, this, you know, this tech is not, not going to transform things. That's, that's probably the context at which I'm sitting here today. I mean, there's a very compelling narrative um, that the proponents um, of these technologies are, are you know, basing, I think, a lot of their energy on and attracting a lot of the venture capital with. Um, and that is, you know, this potentially thousand fold reduction in land footprint, um, you know, the end of animal cruelty. These are all things that I think most people um, can identify with and, and think are wonderful. But, uh, you know, certainly there is, uh, you know, I, I, in terms of the whiff test here, there is a lot of, of wishful thinking. You know, I had to look through that uh, rethink report as well. Um, the word disrupt is all over it. And one can't help but notice that a lot of the uh, venture capital for these companies, a lot of the companies themselves are, you know, based in or around Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, we've seen in energy the ways that um, you know, the thinking from the digital economy um, is not well applied to the physics of, you know, building power uh, infrastructure, for instance. And so, you know, the application of uh, Moore's law, for instance, um, and this, this expectation that solar will become infinitely cheaper, um, I think I've also heard, um, particularly in that rethink uh, report being applied um, to the technologies we're discussing today. Uh, George Mambio as well, uh, amazing speaker and an advocate and activist. Uh, but I think someone else who's who's never, well, I know he's been in one of these plants, but I, I don't think he's familiar with with the fermenters. Yeah, generally, what I find is people, <clears throat> you know, f firstly, the, these groups are very articulate. They often are media savvy, um, and so they set, they tell a story that sounds pretty convincing. You know, they tell a, the, all the these are all the problems, and therefore we have the solution. And if we do a bit of modelling, of course, we'll bring the price down. So if we unpick some of that, one of the ones I've, I, I particularly have a problem with is people start with, well, we're going to have to feel, feed 10 billion people by 2050 or, or, or 2100, and of course we'll have to use these technologies. Now, the reality is we know exactly where those people will be. You know, the, the, look at the WHO stats. They're in Africa. They're in India. They're not in New York. They're not in London. They're not in Sydney. We actually produce plenty of food for the Western. We just don't distribute it very fairly. Um, so that's the first question I ask people is, is your solution a solution for Africa? You know, when, when 90 percent of the food that's produced in Africa is produced by smallholder farmers, this is someone who is earning less than two dollars US a day. It's probably got a couple of cows. I was in Kenya three weeks ago, visited a typical dairy farmer. She had two cows, uh, but she was producing about 20 litres of milk a day, which is pretty good, actually. Um, so they're the people that I look at and go, well, are we providing a solution for you? Because we actually don't provide solutions for Africa. We actually won't solve food security. Um, so that's the first premise that's completely wrong, is that, you know, these are not people looking for an expensive burger. You know, um, then we get into the issues around energy, et cetera. Look, these are fermentations in an energy-hungry um, process. So, again, not just myself, but lots of others have actually pointed out that if you didn't use completely renewable energy sources, you know, wind, um, solar, then you actually wouldn't be more sustainable than uh, conventional meat production. And that's largely looking at the feed, the feedlots, et cetera, because, you know, the reality is if you're running uh, your animals on uh, native pasture, you're pretty sustainable in the first place. So, you know, we can get into a lot of, lot of those sort of de debates. Yeah, look, use, use less land. 
Absolutely, if we put it in a factory and it's vertical. Um, but transformation, as you said, is used very liberally. Um, and I think fundamentally because of these issues around cost of goods, et cetera. We're looking at a very expensive product. You know, um, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of $100 a kilogram. And we're not talking about a, a beautiful steak. We're actually talking about um, meatballs, hamburgers, sausages. So we're talking about the commodity ends of the meat market. Um, uh, you know, so that's the other, just a practical reality is, you know, there's a one, there is one product on the market people may have heard of, you know, in Singapore you can get a, a cell-based chicken nugget. That's $20 a chicken nugget. And they don't make money for that, on that. They lose money on, on that. So that sort of gives you the sort of idea. Now, now, as you said, they'll say, hey, Moore's Law, you know, everything, the cost comes down. The interesting thing about Moore's Law is it's never been applied to a biological system. It's actually, a, it's, it's actually for physical science, you know. So they'll look at it and go, look at the, the cost of sequencing DNA. And you have to point out to them, that's actually a chemical reaction. That's not a biological system, the way we sequence. Um, and so biology is really complex. Cells won't grow above a certain density, you know. They don't like to sit in their own waste. They need a range of growth factors. They won't grow in basic media. These are the things that make mammalian cells difficult to grow, fussy, a lot slower. You know, a mammalian cell doubles in about 24 hours, you know, whereas a bacterium in about one hour. Before we go too much further, um, I just want to define a few terms. Um, you know, I, I did some cell biology as part of my medical education, but it's uh, having to dust off the textbooks here. Um, and we are talking about two um, processes that have something in common, but are also quite different. Um, so maybe um, if you can just, uh, you know, again, uh, in, in a pretty kind of uh, 30,000 uh, foot view, um, some definitions around, you know, what is uh, cultured meat versus precision fermentation, um, maybe some of the similarities and differences, um, you know, the recombinant technology from which um, I guess precision fermentation comes. Uh, just to give our overview, uh, our, our listeners a bit of an yeah. overview of uh, no, what it is exactly we have, dived, we're talking we have about. dived into it, and without defining the terms, I agree. Um, let's just so so cell based meat is the concept that rather than eating the meat of a of an animal that I've grown and I uh, I slaughter, that I take a biopsy from that animal, um, I isolate out the um, the muscle cells, and I grow them in tissue culture. So starting off. Quite small, but eventually I get up to a ten, say a ten thousand liter fermenter, and I'm growing those as a single cell suspension. At some stage, I then change the media and I and and I allow the cells to differentiate into um, myofibers, you know, starting to form muscle cells, and then I harvest that material, and then I use I produce products from that. So that's sort of cell based. So it's, it's, it's cells. Now, we use this technology very successful in the pharmaceutical industry. Monoclonal antibodies is what mostly. So we grow cells and they, they secrete the monoclonal. We don't eat the cells. So we do know about how to grow cells at, at large volumes. You're generally around about 10 to 20,000 to the sort of maximum size. And, and they're the top drugs in the world. So, and, and vaccines, you know, some of the recent COVID vaccines were cell-based. So we grew viruses in cells and we harvested those. So the technologies have been around for a while and we know how to do it, as I said, but it's expensive technology. So that's sort of the concept of cell-based. Precision fermentation, well, when I was a, a young biology student, we called it recombinant protein production. Um, but precision fermentation is a lot sexier term. So that's what we get, it gets called now. And it's essentially, <clears throat> I take a single gene, something like... Um, um, <clears throat> myoglobin, and I, um, I put that inside another organism, generally a yeast, because that we know how to manipulate them very well. That yeast cell grows up and it produces this, um, it's a bit like the Trojan horse sort of concept that, you know, it, it believes this, the, the gene is it produces that protein, and then I harvest that protein, generally by rupturing the yeast cells and separating out the protein. Protein. I've now got a recombinant protein. 
It's what Impossible Burger uses for its product. You know, they use heme. They, they grow up and they produce a recombinant heme and they put that into their burger to give the burger the, the presence that it looks like it's bleeding, it has the smell of meat because it's the heme molecule that does that. But people are also doing it with dairy proteins. They're doing it with enzymes. So precision fermentation, that's the concept there. Um, it, the cost issue is not anywhere as big as it is with, with cell-based meat. Um, so there are a range. So Perfect Day is making a range of products, you know, um, with, uh, with um, dairy proteins, for instance. Um, and, and rennet, which we use for making of cheese, um, that we've been doing that for decades. You know, so, so they're, they're the basic technologies. So, I mean, what you see a lot, um, and we see this in energy as well, is, you know, for instance, within, uh, you know, green hydrogen production, um, you see these great pilot projects. Um, they attract a lot of media. Usually there's a bunch of venture capital behind it. There's a little bit of a moral hazard there because uh, there's certainly a reason why journalists uh, might have an incentive in one shape or form to to hype a technology, whether it's commercial or whether it's just, you know, listen, we're facing a number of potentially existential threats um, in the form of climate or, or the biodiversity crisis. Um, I think there's a very natural human impulse towards hope, uh, towards finding hope, you know, <laughs> in an environment of doom. Um, and, uh, but, but these pilot projects have real issues um, with scaling. And I, I think that would probably be one of your your big uh, criticisms of sort of the errors and how we think about them. But can you, can you tell us a bit more about that? You mentioned the the chicken nugget in, in Singapore. Um, the chicken nugget. So this is a product that is produced by a little manufacturer in Singapore uh, on behalf of Good Meat. Um, but they only really use sort of up to five 10-litre fermenters. So it's, it's what we call pretty small scale. And they only produce... A couple of thousand pounds of the product, so it's it's really a PR exercise, um, you know, to, one to demonstrate that we can get a licensed product in the market. Um, the final product actually is a combination of those cells, the chicken cells they harvest, and plant products. So it's about seventy percent chicken cells and about thirty percent plant based materials. So it's a you know, what we'd call a hybrid hybrid product. And the reality is most of the products that'll come on the market will be these hybrid products. Because the trouble about when you harvest cells at the end, you've got this wet mass of what we call a cell slurry, you know, and you've got to get, the, you've got to get all that water out, but then you've got to generally put some structure in it. So you, you generally add plant-based material or fiber to give it some sort of structure. You know, when I was a young kid, <clears throat> you know, meat rissoles were popular. You take a bit of mince, and you mix it with, with carrot and, and other plant proteins to create a rissole, you know. All we're doing now is taking that cell slurry and mixing it with, a, with other, other um, compounds, largely plant-based. <clears throat> the other interesting thing is, of course, I'm only growing a single cell. Most people, you know, the concept was we grew muscle cells. Some people have moved away from that. We can talk about that. Um, but remember, a piece of steak is lots of different cells. So there are muscle cells there, there are fat cells, there's connective tissue, there's, there's um, blood cells there. So what people do have to do is actually, you know, to get anywhere near the nutrition of meat, they actually have to add things back. They have to add some source of fat. Now they can grow fat cells and add that back, but that's another expense. Or they can add plant-based fats. They have to add minerals. There'll be no B12 there, for instance. Um, so that's the other really interesting thing is people make this statement, oh, cell-based meat is like real meat. Well, it's, it's actually not like real meat at all. It has no structure of real meat. It, it only has certain components of, of meat. So nutritionally, we have to also be very careful in the end that we don't end up producing a product that is less nutritious than red meat. Um, and that often gets forgotten, you know. Walk me through what these factories look like and what's being suggested and proposed. Um, you know, what, what's the biggest thing that's been made so far? I understand you to start small batch and, and work your way up, but I really like, uh, as hard as it is to paint a, you know, a kind of uh, 
um, verbal representation of, of what these what these uh, installations and, and factories look like. So do your best to, to walk us through that and, and describe the production process. All right. So let's let's talk about what, like if I've got a 10,000 litre fermenter, let's just talk a little bit. Now, no one's using that scale for cell base at this stage, but let me just, that's where they're going, you know. Um, so I've got a, it's stainless steel, you know, because it, so it's a large stainless steel vessel. Um, it generally occupies, it's across, say, three floors of a building. So what you do is, is you build it such that at the top, you can access the top of the tanks where you have all your, your sort of monitoring equipment. Um, the middle sort of just sits in a, in a space. You don't, I don't need to access the middle of a tank. And then the bottom is where the effluent flows out. So often you, that's how you construct a factory. Um, that's the sort of scale that people are going to. No one's near that scale at this stage for cell base. But that's a very, fairly routine in the pharmaceutical industry. What I also have to do is I have to filter all the air, you know, and the, and the staff that work in there are generally all completely in, in like a hazmat suit, you know, because what we're trying to do is protect the cells from us. We're trying to... You know, this is sterile culture. This is, you know, long-term sterile culture. So the worst thing we can do is us as humans contaminate. Uh, I have to have positive pressure. So when I open a door, the air flows out of the room because in that air is a whole lot of fungal spores. You know, you only have to take a slice of bread and leave it out on your bench at home for a little while and see what happens, you know. Um, you can't see these fungi. Um, so it's, it's very clean rooms, what we call, you know, we talk about in the biotech, we talk about a very clean room. That is the surfaces are, are coated with particular resins so that they're easy to clean down. The air is filtered, all the water is filtered. Um, so it's a fairly sophisticated. Now, what these people have said at times is, oh, we won't need to have all that stuff, all that extra tech that you pharmaceutical guys use. But I point out that that's actually to protect the cells. <laughs> you know, so you actually will need, and, and the biggest factory probably was, has a pilot facility built uh, by Upside, so in the US, um, and they can produce, I think it's about um, 50,000 pounds of meat a year uh, out of that facility. Now, if you think about that, that's actually about 1,000 pounds a week. And then if you think about the weight you know, you know, it's issue of comparable to red meat. That's about three carcasses. So that's about the weight of three carcasses. So that's from a meat production, that's a backyard butcher. You know, so that's, we've got to put scale. So people say, oh, look what we've done, we've scaled. Well, you actually haven't, you know, that, and they call it a pilot, but, but that's so, so that's sort of where it's at. Now they need to go well beyond that. Um, people like, um, uh, you know, good meat people, they've actually gone out and commissioned 250,000 litre fermenters. And they're saying, well, we're going to go to scale. But we've never grown cells above 20, 10 or 20,000. So it, there's no scientific rationale to suddenly jump to that scale. Because cells well, are there's, quite there's risk. There's risk too, that oh, I think you mentioned, risk. right? If you get a contamination yeah, look, event. I, I, yeah, I, I use the sort of, you know, try, trying to get that risk across to people. It's sort of like, you know, there's a guy that I know and he builds five five story buildings, you know, and I suddenly say to him, well, I'd like you to build me a 250 story building, you know, which he's never done before. And then I'm going to put my family on the top floor. You know, I mean, we're talking about tech that we haven't scaled. So to build a facility before you've demonstrated is even feasible is really high risk. Um, as I said, cells settle down. So we actually generally, in tanks, we have to have some way of stirring them. We can use propellers or we can use air. But of course, the bigger the tank, the more the, the air pressure we have to use and cells will rupture. You know, these are mammalian cells. They don't have a hard exterior. So that they're, they're, you know, one of the problems of growing mammalian cells is they, they're always looking for a way to die <laughs> um, or rupture. And then, of course, we don't have a product at all. So I think 
going above 10 or 20,000 litres is really not sound science. And, and some of the other cell-based meat people have called that out. So, so, you know, it's not just me, but it's other people like the, you know, the CEO of Believe in Meat who's also said, you know, it's just from issues of sheer force on cells, you probably can't go above 10 or 20,000 litres. Um, and that, that then becomes a problem in scale. You know, you can for, for precision fermentation, you know, for, because you're looking there at yeast, et cetera, a lot hardier. So people do those ferments already at, say, 100,000 litres, and that, that's sort of where that has to get to. So we're seeing um, uh, Liberation Labs in the US is commissioning a facility where they're going to have four 150,000 litre tanks. So that's quite doable, that, that, but that's yeast fermentation not mammalian cells. Um, so so the, the, issue, the technical issues are different for mammalian cell growth as they are for um, yeast cell growth. Let, let's stick uh, with, the, it seems like the harder of the two, um, these cell cultures. Um, so you, you get up to these um, large vats, and you said 10,000, 20,000 liters seems to be the maximum that the system allows. Um, but you start you start small and you need to do all these transfers. And tell me about the risk of, of bacterial fungal contamination and the consequences. Sure. So what you generally do is you do transfers at one in 10. So if I start, I've got one litre, I transfer that to 10 litres. You know, because cells, um, they're social creatures. They signal each other, you know. So, so I can't take one litre uh, and put it in a 10,000 litre tank. It's not going to work. So you generally scale up in orders of magnitude of one to 10. Um, so we have what we call a, a, a fermentation train. You know, I've got my one litre fermenter and it goes to 10 or 20 and that goes to 200, you know, 2,000 and et cetera. So I generally have those sort of steps. So I've got maybe, say, five fermenters in a row. As I move cells from one to another, I've got to make sure that I don't contaminate them. So you generally have all of those um, connected you know, we're, we're, we're tubing um, so that it's it's a contained system. I've got to have sterile media, so I have to filter everything. Uh, I start I have, to have sterile water. The other interesting thing if that sometimes people forget is if I've got a 10,000-litre tank that I'm going to grow my cells in, I actually have to have a 10,000-litre tank that holds the media that I would pump in there before I add my cells. Then I need another 10,000-litre tank when I harvest the cells that I pump the cells into the harvest. So you can start to see how big this factory is. Um, and uh, people, you know, none of these exist, but people have done estimates, um, you know, and they estimate that a decent sized factory would cost about 400 million US to build. Now, I had a couple of other people have a look at that and said it's probably closer to 600 million, but let's not quibble about a lot of money, by of the way. <laughs> yeah. um, and hence what happens in the end is the facility cost, which people never think about, in the, in, you know, the people who are talking about cell-based meat, never talk about facility costs. The depreciation on that becomes a major cost part of the cost of goods. So we've been saying that from the start. You're not thinking about, you know, what your costs are going to be on the facility. And very interesting, just in the last few weeks, someone's actually come out, an engineering group, have used a bit of design software, and they came up with an estimate that the facility costs would actually be 48% of the cost of the product. So from being told, no, we won't worry about that, we're now actually saying, oh, wait a minute, it could be 48% of your costs. And that's probably reasonably accurate, I think. I mean, part of part of the the um, things I've, again, heard George Mambio say is, you know, the, I think, and I think this is the category error, is com comparing this, um, and particularly the cell culturing, to you know your local craft brewery and hey you can have craft breweries you know all everywhere and they can make the beers that people like and so we could have these facilities making the kind of foods and flavors that would you know there's a, a real um love of decentralization that i think is part of the kind of eco-romantic narrative um and it's very much on display there but 
I, uh, especially if it coming across your work, I found myself quite skeptical of those kind of claims, and, th and that this could be done on a community level and community control. It's 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 a very familiar narrative to me. What is that? Yeah, it is a very familiar nar narrative. It's the same narrative we heard about vertical farming. Remember that you know we could all you know have our vertical farms, you know, and and that and that hasn't turned out. We're actually out, starting to see uh, a number of those large facilities being closed down now because energy costs have gone up and they're no longer making any sense. So it's always a nice, the concept that this is like brewing beer, well, it's not really <laughs> at all, um, uh, other than the fact that, yes, brewing beer is a fermentation process, but it's, uh, it's not like mammalian cells, it's more like the yeast. And because they produce alcohol, to some extent, you don't have the problems of sterility. Um, and it's a shorter fermentation, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's like a lot of things. That it's the details that, you know, when you get into it, sort of make those systems um, not really work. It's also quite sophisticated. I mean, you know, this is uh, mammalian cell growth is a very sophisticated technology. Um, you know, the media we use uh, has literally hundreds of components in there, minerals, vitamins, uh, growth hormones, um, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I think the concept that I have a cell factory in my backyard uh, and I make my own stakes, I think that's probably pretty farcical. Um, uh, will we need a lot of factories? Yes, we will need a lot of factories to feed people. Uh, and then I go and ask the question, is that a solution for Africa? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, it, it's, as I said, the interesting thing, the tech works. It's just, it's just complicated technology, expensive technology. You've mentioned energy costs, um, something that constrained the, the vertical farming revolution, if we want to call it that. Um, how significant are the energy costs uh, to these uh, these facilities? Look, what do you have to do with that energy in, in cell culturing, for yeah, instance? What yeah, are some let's of the talk big about draws? The, yeah. So when, when we grow mammalian cells, we grow them at 37 degrees. So it's body temperature, okay? So I have to have a tank and I have to have it at 37 now, to do that, you generally, these, these stainless steel tanks are water jacketed, you know, so you have a water jacket and you're, you're changing that temperature to keep the temperature um, of the tank at the same. So that 37, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's warm. Um, it, then I'm getting a lot of radiant heat coming off that. If you think about it, I put a, a tank there and, at, and it's running at 37 degrees, there's going to be a lot of radiant energy coming off that. So then I have to actually um, air condition the room that it's in, you know. And now I'm going to put 130,000 of the 130 of these big tanks in a facility, and you can start to think about the energy sort of side of that. I've got to run it all at 37. I've got to cool all the air, depending on where I put my factory. You know, like even let's take the US. You know, if I put it in the Midwest. At certain times, I'm going to have to warm the air, you know, when you get down to those minus 20s and minus 30s outside. So I'm not going to put a tank outside. I'm going to actually have it inside a facility. I've also got to filter all that air. So I've got to, have, I've got to be running a filtration system for all the air coming into the facility. And that's sort of where the energy stuff costs come up. And, and I've got to run this 24-7. So it's, it's not like I turn the switch off you know, this is this is runs continuously. Um, so very, from the very start, some people looked at that and said, "Well, that's going to be energy intensive. Let's do some you know um, calculations." And and people out of Oxford University said, "Look, it'll have to all be renewable energy sources, or it's not going to be more sustainable." And and report after report has come back and said the same thing. <laughs> what are the implications of intermittent energy on this whole process? If you have a wind lull and, and clouds for a week, uh, how does that affect uh, your production? Well, that's the last thing cells like. I mean, you know, these are, you know, you know, as I said, mammalian cells in particular, you can't just take them up and down. You know, they won't grow. If, you know, so if you drop the temperature down, they won't grow. Uh, they'll probably die. Um, so, yeah, we, we could not have intermittent temperatures. It would be a manufacturing disaster to have fluctuation in temperatures. We, we could generally have a fluctuation of a couple of, of one or two degrees. Even that's not good. 
but um, probably beyond that would be uh, would be a real problem. So we, we've been, I think, fo- focusing on the uh, the cell culture side of things, and I've I've you know come from nowhere to having a you know very basic level of understanding based on your descriptions. Um, is it worth talking a little more um, about some of the nuances and specificities in precision fermentation? Um, it seems, as you were mentioning, a bit easier uh, to just have the yeast make specific proteins, um, you know, and that's how we make insulin, for instance. I'm obviously struck yeah. by, you know, there's a lot of diabetics in the world. We make a lot of insulin, but it's a, you know, the I administer insulin at work uh, as, a, as an emergency physician, and it's not a lot of volume. And when we're yeah. talking about growing macronutrients for the world, um, it strikes me that there's a scaling issue there. All that aside, let's let's talk about the precision fermentation side. If there's any differences in in you know what the processes and factories look like and and the implications of the growing process. Sure. So the sort of tanks we use, stainless steel tanks are pretty standard, you know, and the and the sort of. Um, but it, it's a bit simpler with yeast. As I said, they will grow. Uh, we, we already grow them to large scales. As I said, there are factories, not many of them, but there are factories, particularly in Europe, that are currently at the 100,000, 200,000 litre capacity you know, for an individual tank. Uh, I heard, I was in New Zealand last week, and I heard from a guy that originally there's a company in, in England that built a 1 million litre fermentation uh, tank. Um, to produce a product. Uh, I, hadn't, I actually hadn't heard the story before. And the reason I hadn't heard it before is in the end, the product didn't turn out to be economically sound and the factory was torn down. So, so it's sort of a, a, a cautionary tale. Um, uh, so, so here, the, t- the tech's a lot more doable. You know, we, we actually already grow uh, yeast cells to that sort of scale. What generally happens is where the cost comes in is when I have to then separate that protein away from my yeast cells. So I've got yeast cells, they're producing this protein. Sometimes they'll secrete it into the media, sometimes they won't. But in the end, we we talk about downstream processing. So that's the steps after fermentation where I've got to get my, my desired protein back. That's the big cost with precision fermentation. That's about... 50 to 60 percent of the cost, because depending on the purity you want. So, if you want your desired protein at 90 percent or greater purity, now in the pharmaceutical industry we actually use purities of 95 to 99 percent. That's very expensive tech because I've got to use a lot of uh, different steps to get to that purity. Um, because the if you think about it, the bulk of the material that I ferment. I'm not going to use, you know, the, the yeast. I don't. Use, I need, don't need the yeast cells. So I only want that one protein. Uh, that also creates a problem because then I've got a great weight. I've got a, a, a large waste stream. You know, what do I do with that waste stream? So you can process that down, and you can do things with that, but it's generally not economical to to spend the time. You go after the protein of interest. The higher the purity, the the lower your yields. What I mean there is. If I want really high purity, I'm going to lose some of my protein in the fractionation step. And often you get yields that will fall sort of below 70%. So 30% of the protein I'm, I've just spent all that time growing, I lose in the fractionation steps. Um, so that's the sort of, you know, that's some of the cost there. But it, it, it's a lot more doable. I mean, if you, if you think about the difference, at the moment we're talking with mammalian cells that it's a a thousand-fold difference in cost to current meat production. So a thousand-fold. So we've got a lot of – it's not the, – the gaps aren't as big in the precision fermentation space. Um, so people are – you know, there are products on the, you know, on the market. Um, as I said, um, Perfect Day produces one milk protein, lactoglobulin, glob, lactoglobulin, and they produce a product called Brave Robot. Uh, ice cream, uh, but it's fifty dollars a bucket. Now I don't know. I don't know what a bucket of ice cream costs in the in the states, but you know I'm sure there's brands a lot cheaper than fifty dollars. So, so you still got a cost one, of one one protein, not the the six proteins. Oh, that that's the them. other thing. You know, it, it's one protein. You know, it's it's um, 
you know, milk is made up of six major proteins, but there are actually literally hundreds of proteins in there. And then there's minerals and vitamins and et cetera. And we see that when we make baby formula. It's very hard to, to mimic the complexity of milk, obviously. Yeah, and it's quite interesting. When, when the FDA approved this product, it actually specifically said you cannot use it for baby formula because it, it understood that nutritionally it is not equivalent to, to dairy. Um, so it's mostly used as a filler you know, into products, you know, you put it in. But then people say, well, it's dairy. It's got dairy protein in there. I, I use the analogy when I talk to people because I was trying to think, how do I get this across? And uh, I used this analogy last week in, in New Zealand where I showed them a picture, <clears throat> a picture of the Mona Lisa, you know, this painting that everyone recognises. You know, it's this beautiful texture and colours and, and, and that, like, you know, it's, everyone knows it. Then I show them a, a black and white image of the Mona Lisa. Now, everyone recognises it as the Mona Lisa. It's such a distinctive painting. But now it's flat. It lacks texture. It's one colour. It's one-dimensional. It's fake. You know? And so I use that as an analogy of, like, I can't, you can't just take a single protein and declare that as dairy. You know, I think... I think the cell-based meat people are going to have a problem. I can't just use a single cell type and say that's meat. Well, it it's not. Well, and there's there's just like some intrinsic common sense here in terms of you know how complex we are as biological organisms, how complex. And again, I think bringing it back to this idea of mother's milk, you know, formula is pretty damn good. It's not a, not a total equivalency. You don't have some antibodies and things that you need. We probably overhype, um, you know, how much worse it is. Uh, you know, I've definitely been guilty of that in medicine and guilt tripping women. Um, but it's it's pretty magical stuff, you know, the real thing. Um, and I think that is a you know really potent you know imagery for me because again, if if you approach this stuff on a surface level, you read a few articles that are again maybe sponsored by the company itself, or again, as I mentioned, this this psychological bias towards you know wanting to have solutions in the face of these very uh, challenging ecological times we find ourselves in, um, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't get to this this level of depth and complexity. Um, so again, it's 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 really great having you on. Um, so obviously, you know, there's been a lot of money that's gone into the sector, and I think you know, returning to this idea of Moore's law, I mean, a lot of the capital that has been generated in the last few decades has happened by you know people working in the IT sector where Moore's law did apply um so maybe um understandable that they um maybe got overly enthusiastic in the sector is the investment continuing to roll in or are some of these uh scalability issues starting to uh shake investor confidence do you have any idea about that yeah, yeah we're probably tr tracking behind the plant based people to some extent because you know the the plant base was really very popular billions of dollars you know i think there's something like 1300 companies now in that space but what we did see in the last in 2022 is the market start to soften the actual you know volume of product went down costs have gone up so in we're seeing about 10% of plant based products coming off supermarket shelves as supermarkets sort of get rid of the products that aren't selling uh, etc so we are seeing that. Uh, we saw, um, you know, between Beyond and uh, Oatly, those two companies just between them lost $20 billion of market value in the last 18 months. So that scared the market a bit. So we're actually seeing um, uh, a decrease in the amount of money available for new companies. I think there's also an, uh, an expectation that there are too many. You know, in the cell-based meat, there's probably about 150 companies now. Many of them aren't differentiated from the other ones. So, you know, they won't go anywhere. But that's that's the tech space, you know, a lot of startups. So the lack of differentiation. So people are also already starting to say there'll be a reset. Um, we saw one of the large uh, cell-based companies in San Francisco uh, recently uh, shut down. Uh, they couldn't find a buyer. They'd, I think they'd got their facility at about 90% completion. Uh, and they couldn't find a buyer, so they just shut the whole thing down. They'd spent about, I think, $40 million or something or other to get to that stage. Um, so I think there's a little bit of nervousness um, uh, in the uh, markets, uh, in, in the investment markets. Um, 
I think one of the problems <coughs> we're actually talking about with both these technologies is that a lot of people have come in, the investors have come in from, as you say, the IT world, where the margins are actually pretty good. And they come into the food sector. The margins in the food sector are single, di single digit. You know what I mean? And I don't think people have realised that. So that it's not an ideal thing for, to add a lot of cost in because your margins are already. And the supply chain is also uh, you know, rather constrained. You know, if you think about the it's the same sort of 10 or 12 companies, global companies controlling food essentially. Um, now, most of them have made investments in this technology because to be honest, in the end, they don't actually mind what you eat as long as you buy it from them. So, um, uh, and then of course, you've got supermarkets. You know, in Australia, we've got two supermarkets that control 60% of all uh, processed food sales. So, uh, you know, they then tell you what price, you know, they'll accept your product at and uh, they'll tell you what you're going to pay them to put it on their shelf. You know, so that the sort of value chain is also very different uh, in the food industry. So I think that's been a bit of a wake up for some investors to realise that this is not like IT investment. How, how have you been received in terms of um, the critical thinking you're bringing to this picture. I imagine people um, are suspicious maybe of your intentions. This seems like such a great promising technology and answers so many questions. Um, yeah, how, how's the response been um, to, to what you're bringing to the conversation? Um, well, it's, it, it varies. You know, when I've, you know, I've been to a number of these, you know, there's a company here in, um, in Sydney called Vow. They were all over, if you haven't seen the the Mammoth Ball product this week. Uh, they're behind right. that. Um, so I visited Tell us what them. that is. I, stop, stop for a second know. and tell us what that is. Yeah, okay. A... So that was released this week where they they basically um, took uh, the, the sequence for the woolly mammoth, for a gene from the woolly mammoth, myoglobin. They synthetically made that, that gene. They inserted that into uh, lamb cells. And they grew up those cells and they made a one kilogram meatball called the mammoth ball. Um, it's gone into a museum in Sweden. It's never going to be eaten. Uh, you couldn't because we, you know, the, the regulatory people would, you know, uh, would never allow it because, you know, uh, lots of reasons there. But it's a fantastic piece of PR. It, it made the front page. It got on the US TV because it's such a great story, you know. This one kilogram mammoth ball. Um, now, <clears throat> we stretched the science a little bit. Is it a mammoth? Uh, well, it was actually a, a lamb cell that we put a mammoth gene into. Was it a mammoth gene? Well, we think it was a sequence close to a mammoth, what we could do from, you know. So, you know, it's it's a lovely piece of PR. Uh, and, uh, and, and look, uh, Val acknowledged that, you know. They actually do produce another product, which is quite interesting because they produce a quail cell product, uh, which they call Morsel. But they actually admit that it's, it's going to be $100 a kilogram. So it's going to go into that top end. So I actually, Val at least are honest about their business model. They're actually going to make exotic products for high-end consumers. Yeah, I have a self-indulgent uh, anecdote, which is... Um... A friend of my father's, um, who's a geologist, used to go to conferences in the former Soviet Union. Um, and as he tells the story, um, they dug up um, a mammoth from a glacier and actually carved up some of the meat and served it at a geological convention. He, he, he got violently ill afterwards, but he, he got a slice of the real thing. So the story goes. <laughs> he was a pretty, uh, pretty honest guy, but... Yeah, this is the concept that, you know, that Vow has talked about. They can have exotic meats. Uh, you could have rhinoceros meat or you could have uh, you know, kangaroo. Well, we harvest kangaroos now. I, I, had a ve I had a vegan friend that joked that he, you know, the only meat he ate was from endangered species, but I guess that's that's now possible to do ethically. Well, you know, <laughs> I've got, I've got you, know, you know, dairy friends that say, you know, their cows are vegans. Uh, you know, their cows only eat grass. Uh, they're, so they're vegan cows, so the milk they produce is clearly a vegan product. So if we, 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 we can get into some sort of debates about what a product is. You know, you asked me how I'm received. Um, so I think the people, the, the tech people, act, you know, actually 
are not, you know, many of them don't disagree with what I'm saying. They just sort of say, well, we hope we can solve these problems. The groups that tend to take a bit of a violent reaction to me are the vegan groups because I'm, I'm taking down their unicorn, you know, their, this beautiful unicorn there that's going to solve all the problems of the world, and I'm attacking that. Well, I'm not attacking. I'm just pointing out some of the technical challenges, some of the commercial, because we haven't even talked about consumers yet, which is a pretty important piece of it at the end. Um, so they tend, you know, on, on LinkedIn, the, they, the vegans don't like me at all. Well, let, I mean, we'll pivot in a second to the kind of consumer confidence. Um, one of the narratives, um, uh, you know, and it, it actually it's very similar to me um, to the questions around renewable energy is that, you know, it's just not happening. Um, it's not because of any feasibility issues or scalability issues or just that fossil fuels are so damn hard to replace. Uh, but it's it's conspiratorial. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that Monbio has said is basically, you know, there's you know, three or four food companies that control the world's food supply. And this, this, you know, precision fermentation, cell culture stuff is so potentially disruptive, um, you know, that it could threaten their business model. You know, we need to put this, this technology, this advanced precision technology, you know, in the creative commons. Um, th these are some of the ideas I hear. I'm guessing that you, you don't think that there's too much water being held by that, that vessel. Oh, look, you know, you, we've seen all of the big companies go into this technology. We've seen JBS and, you know, the big one of the biggest meat producers invest in cell-based meats. Um, we've seen Nestle investing in precision fermentation. We've seen um, um, you know, some of the big dairy companies doing plant-based. As I said, the food industry is a pretty pragmatic industry. You know, they'll produce what they believe customers want. Um, so I don't, I, I don't believe in the end uh, it's those companies holding anything back. They're, they're just realising that if they have to sell a product and it's three times as, as much as, say, milk, which is sort of the one we're talking about, um, then they know consumers, you know, we know price is a big issue. I mean, people are hurting out there now. So we're already seeing a growth in cheaper cuts of meat. You know, uh, I mean, chicken, the growth in chicken, if you think about the, large, the, you know, the largest um, meat consumed in numbers is chicken. And it's largely because it's very cheap to produce. Um, uh, so, so I think, you know, the su supermarkets that understand that issue about price and customers. So, you know, um, you know, what what we might view as luxury. I mean, to some extent, if you look at the price on, say, on the plant-based milk, and they're two or three times what what a, a, um, a cow's milk is. Um, so consumers are just looking at, well, you know, do I really, can I afford it? You know? Um, so I think, what do we know about the food industry? We know that taste drives people. So if someone that doesn't like the taste of something, but after taste, it's price, taste and price, you know, and, and, and if you forget that in the food industry, then um, you'll have a problem. I mean, there was a, a, a plant-based chicken product where I remember debating with the, the founder of that company and she said, oh, well, look, the taste doesn't really matter. Well, when they did a taste test, people rated her product a two out of 20. Um, you know, it does matter. <laughs> You know, it's, it's interesting, my own relationship to food over the years. Um, I was briefly a vegan. I was a vegetarian for five or six years, um, largely because I didn't want other people doing my dirty work. I thought if I can't kill an animal, then then I shouldn't have someone else put the blood in their hands. I <laughs> later kind of swung the other way and became a, a hunting guide at one point and did some of that myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I I'd worked with um, more working animals. Uh, I was a horse wrangler. So just a different kind of evolving relationship to to animals. Um, and, you know, I don't, maybe it's just a protection mechanism you put in place. Those of us who eat meat, when we think about the conditions under which they're raised, um, one tends to, you know, be a humanist and draw some pretty strong distinctions between, you know, we're all animals, but, you know, you're different. Your life is less valuable. And maybe I've taken that too far, but when I when I look at you know boiler chickens and you know the kind of conversion rates, the feed conversion rates, I mean this is probably the most environmentally friendly form of of high quality meat protein we can get. 
And these birds have been so genetic. I mean, I've raised these chickens before. I mean, they're just freaks of nature, the way they put on weight. They can barely hold themselves up. I mean, I've started to see them as vegetables, which is, you know, I'm sure some people, some of my listeners would be shocked and horrified by. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in terms of what you view as as the solutions, again, moving forward to feeding 10 billion people, making sure we have high quality protein. Um, again, they're very compelling narratives. If, if I could just take things at the at the level of the wishful thinking and the promise, I'd be I'd be all on board and proselytizing about this. But I can't help but be curious. And, and as I see the, the kind of holes emerge and in, in what's being promised. Uh, particularly at particularly at just not being affordable to you know where we're going to see the population growth i'm i'm uh, alarmed so what what do you think of as as the solutions to uh our impending challenges feeding a, a, a larger population so i think i think there's a lot of tech we can use so if you think about genetic selection of you know we've we've for thousands of years have selected better strains of rice and wheat and and uh, better animals so we know that Genetics allows us. We, you know, you can go too far, as you've just sort of mentioned. Um, um, but we've got fantastic technology now to select and make better both plants and animals. Um, we can make uh, animals that are uh, safer to work with. So, with a simple, ge- you know, gene change, we can dehorn all cattle. Um, safer for them, safer for us. Um, we can make animals disease resistant. We already make plants disease resistant with, with, with genes. So, so some of the tech that sort of people were worried about is actually now even, you know, some of the green groups are going, oh, maybe we should actually accept that technology because it's actually get, it's greener. I mean, GMO technology is, is a great example. We generally not use, don't use that term now. We use gene editing, et cetera. So there's a lot of tech that actually can help us with both food, with food production, both plants and animals. Um, uh, as I said, if we go to places like Africa, you know the 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 yields are so much lower. That's where we've got to really help. Um, we can make plants that are more salt tolerant. Very important in Australia that are more heat tolerant. We can make we can select animals that are more heat tolerant. We already know with certain breeds of cattle, the African cattle are more heat tolerant, uh, tick resistant. Um, so I think we've got to use a lot of the tech. People, you know, I mean, the people who rally, I, I find it amazing the people who rally against the GMO technology. Um, you know, it's been around now for so many decades. Um, you, know, uh, you know, when I talk to a certain green leader, I asked them, do they believe in vaccination? I said, of course I do. And I said, well, you vaccinate your children? Yes. I said, so, you know, that's a GMO vaccine you just use on your children. So, you know, there's, it's not science. We're not arguing. It's not the science that's getting in the way. It's, you know, it's some sort of um, cherished views that people aren't willing to let go of. So I think there is... Aesthetic, the, aesthetic, uh, food yeah. distribution's got to be a, an issue. I mean, we waste a lot of food. Um, you know, when I lived in America, I... The size of meals that, you know, it's almost what people expect. I expect a plate that's overflowing with food. I'm not getting value if it's not. But they don't eat it, you know. And, and so, so we know that food waste is enormous uh, thing. One of my other hats is I, I actually chair an insect protein company where we take food waste and use insects to produce protein that we make dog treats out of. Um, so there, are, there is tech that can help us on the food waste side of it, um, but there's also behaviour. Um, you, know, you know, let's just be, let's take the amount of food and put it on a plate that we actually need to eat. We've got a massive obesity problem, you know, um, largely driven by highly processed foods and sugar. You know, um, 60% of what Americans eat these days is highly processed food. Um, so, so there, we know what the problems are, but where our systems seem to not allow us at times to, to solve them. Um, and then we got groups who get fearful of tech. We've got other groups who are promoting, you know, the sort of newer, newer tech. So it is a complicated uh, space. As I said, I, I just finished chairing a board of an of a organisation, a charity that works in India and Africa with smallholder farmers, trying to help them um, produce, you know, have healthier animals and be more product productive. 
So there's a lot we can do there. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm very positive about the future of, of food security. Um, but some of the inequalities are uh, inequalities that exist uh, in many parts of, of our, you know, our, our global systems. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. A few, a few thoughts come to mind. One is, you know, as you mentioned, the, the kind of niche value of these products. It reminds me of, um, you know, luxury uh, electric vehicles, for instance, um, you know, which are not really a solution that, that most people can afford, although it sounds like technologically less complicated uh, and potentially more scalable than what we're talking about here today. Um, the other very sort of tongue-in-cheek um, comment I'd have, and this is not a medical recommendation whatsoever, but um, it's been interesting to watch the explosion of Ozempic, uh, which is a diabetes drug and appetite suppressant, um, which is you know just spreading like wildfire, um, particularly uh, in the U.S. Um, and it's actually shaping a lot of, uh, particularly New York restaurants, to make much smaller serving sizes. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not advocating that as a solution to our our food woes, but interesting, uh, some of the developments we're seeing. But look, it's interesting, you know, um, uh, Jack Bobo has got a good book out called Why Smart People Make Dumb Food Choices. And, and you know, he talks about this whole th issue about, you know, food. But one of the things he talks about there is an experiment Google's d done with, you know, they serve a million meals a day, you know, free to their staff. So they take price out of it. But one of the things they did was looking at trying to serve healthier food is they shrunk the plate. They just decreased this. And it had an, a, a, an automatic response. They found that people didn't go back for a second plate. They just ate, ate less. So they had, I think, a 15% reduction in what they consumed just by actually presenting them with a smaller plate. That's, that's, that's some pretty simple technology, uh, Paul. Uh, listen, we're, we've come to the hour. Um, this has been fascinating. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of things I should have asked you, and I'm, I'm sure the audience will engage and be active in the comments section. Um, if you are a regular Decouple listener, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube account. I've got a great new video out uh, this week, uh, Jesse Freeston tackling the issue of nuclear waste. Um, Paul, where can people find you? Again, this is something that really bothers me is um, – how hard it was to find you, how hard it was to, like, I can't find a, you know, I search Paul Wood precision fermentation on YouTube, nothing comes up. I just, you know, had to go through this maze of LinkedIn to, uh, to do some background research. So I really want to change that, but where can people find you um, and learn more about your thinking? So on they can subject? find me on LinkedIn. I, I use LinkedIn. I don't understand some of the other social media things. LinkedIn, I can actually post quality material. Uh, Paul.Wood1508. You can find me on LinkedIn. You'll find some of the debates I get in. There's a few. There's more and more videos as I give talks. Uh, the talk I gave in New Zealand last week was was filmed and is is will be out there. Um, I did one in Ireland last last year. So so there's more of those if you like videos that are out there. Um, I've got another paper coming out shortly in Food Frontier talking about some of this tech. Um, but the easiest source is find me on, on LinkedIn, happy to continue the discussion. I think it is a really important debate um, and it's an important debate that we, we need to have. So, yeah, really, you know, it's, a, it's a, the piece that I most enjoy as a scientist. I enjoy actually having the discussion with people. Whether they agree with me or not, it's a really important discussion for us to have. Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming on Decouple and, and starting that conversation with us.